And the Prophet Sallallahu he was in the womb of his mother two months. His mother was pregnant. So the scholars, they discussed the Abdullah actually know that his wife was pregnant. وَأَقُولُ قَالَ اللَّهُ جَلَّ جَلَالُهُ وَالْمُصْطَفَ الْهَادِي وَلَا أَتَأَوَّلُ الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد we're going to resume, inshallah ta'ala, and carry on the seerah and the biography of our beloved Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to talk about wafatu Abdullah ibn Abdi al-Muttalib, the death of the Prophet's father sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah, the father of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, uh, went to Sham. He went to what? He went to Sham. And he went with a caravan. According to the strongest opinion, he went with A'ir. A'ir in Arabic language is a caravan, but it's specifically uh, camels. Okay? Which the Arabs used to do, send to Sham for trading. Abdullah went with that. Um, and on there, there was a lot of merchants in which Quraysh was selling in Sham. And on the way back, they were going to bring more tradings or more merchants from Sham to uh, Mecca. And as you all know, the uh, caravan used to go through the route of Medina. Okay, it used to go through what? Medina. That was a route in which it would take to go to Sham. So when they went to Medina, Abdullah he became sick. The father of the Prophet ﷺ, he became sick severely, heavily. Okay, and he said to them, uh, the people who he was with, he said to them, "Ana atakhallafu inda akhwali." And a takhallafu means I'm going to remain, I'm going to stay behind. Inda akhwali, akhwal is a plural of the word khal, okay, which is the Abdullahi's maternal uncles. Abdullahi's maternal uncles are Adi ibn Najjar, the tribe Adi ibn Najjar, who lived in Medina. So he said, I'll stay with them and I'll remain with them. And he stayed with them for an entire month, sick. Um, what happened was, uh, the caravan, they came back to Mecca, and Abdul, Abdul Muttalib, the father of Abdullah, and the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, he started to question, and he started to ask, where is my son Abdullah, when they came. And they said, he's sick. And we already mentioned that Abdullah he was the most beloved individual to Abdul Muttalib from all of his children. He loved Abdullah so much. So when they informed him and they said to him that Abdullah is in Medina and he is staying with his maternal uncles, um, Adi ibn Najjar, that tribe, uh, and he's sick. Abdullah, Abdul Muttalib said, no, 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 no. My son Abdullah, he is a very strong individual. And for him to say, I'm staying back, uh, I'm going to not come, is a uh, indication that his illness is a bit more than what you think. And fathers tend to know their children, right? Fathers, they tend to know their children. Some of your children, they can endure pain. When things happen to them, they don't easily complain. And some of them, if their nail breaks, ah, the whole day is like, ah, I'm in pain. Sah? So Abdullah was not one of those kids who would complain easily. And for him to say, I'm going to stay back and not go with you guys, and I'm going to stay in Medina, was an indication to Abdul Muttalib. Um, it was an indication to Abdul Muttalib that Abdullah's illness was severe. So what he did was, he said to his son Al-Harith, now, 
I'm going to ask you guys a question to see who was paying attention. Hadith is the brother of Abdullah and the son of Abdul Muttalib. In our last lesson, we mentioned the children of Abdul Muttalib, his sons. Where does Al Harith fall in? His sons. Hey? He was his first son. He was the oldest son that he had. Al Harith was the oldest. So what happened was Abdul Muttalib said, uh, Harith, you go to uh, Medina. Now, that time Medina was called Yathrib. Medina, Medina was called what? It was called Yathrib. And Yathrib is the name of one of the Amaliqa. Remember, we mentioned this Amaliq, the tribe, one of the tribes that perished. So, Yathrib was a name after that. When the Prophet came to Medina, he changed the name. Inshallah, we're going to come to that. The Prophet gave it a few names. Tayyibah was one of the names that he gave. Alayhi salatu wasalam, the name Al Medina, the city, is also names from the names of Al Medina. As for the narration that came where the Prophet has said, as it said, to not call Medina Al Yathrib, then that narration is weak, it's not authentic. There is no authentic evidence to show. Uh, the prohibition of calling Medina Yathrib. Because Allah mentioned the word Yathrib in the Quran, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does anyone know the verse? Hufav. Who knows the verse? Hey, Ibrahim. وَإِذْ قَالَ طَائِفَةُ مِنْهُمْ يَا أَهْلَ يَثْرِبَ لَا مُقَامَ لَكُمْ فَرْجِعُوا وَيَسْتَأْذِنُ فَرِيقٌ مِنْهُمُ النَّبِيَّ يَقُولُونَ إِنَّ بُيُوتَنَا عَوْرَةٌ وَمَا هِيَ بِعَوْرَةٌ يُرِيدُونَ إِلَّا فِرَارًا so Allah mentioned Yathrib in the Quran. But the scholars, they said Allah mentioned it fi siyaq al -dham. Allah mentioned it in the context of the, Jew, uh, the, the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. The hypocrites were the ones who said, وَإِذْ قَالَ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ A group of the hypocrites said. So Allah didn't mention Yathrib in the context of naming the city Medina Yathrib or praising that. Allah only mentioned it on the tongue of the munafiqeen. He was talking about them. So the scholars, they said, this shows also that the mentioning of it is something that you should avoid. Once it's been named al Medina, sah, to take it back to a name before that, or a name other than that is not praiseworthy. So, and uh, Harith, he came to uh, the city of Medina, and he found that his brother Abdullah he passed away. He came and his brother Abdullah had already passed away and he was buried and he was buried in Fidari Nabigha. That's where he was buried. Uh, and Nabigha is Dar, yani the place that he prepared, there was a place that this man and Nabigha prepared for the people who passed away. And he was a man from the people of Adi ibn Najjar. He buried the Prophet's father. Uh, there, and Al Harith ibn Abdul Muttalib, he came back to his father Abdul Muttalib, and he, he informed him that Abdullah he passed away, uh, and then this hurt Abdi Al Muttalib. It hurt him. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his birth. This is the next point that we're going to talk about, inshallah ta'ala When Abdullah he passed away the father of the Prophet والسلام, The Prophet وسلم, the scholars disputed. Um, but before I go into this, there's a narration I wanted to mention, which is a weak narration, but it's worth mentioning because Ibn Sa'di mentions it in his tabaqat. So I'll just mention it as a benefit. And also Ibn Ishaq mentions it in his seerah and as Suhailiyu in his kitab, Rawdul Uluf, he discusses it. And this story is as follows. A woman came and presented herself to Abdullah, the father of the Prophet ﷺ, meaning presented herself in a, in a wrong way. She wanted something haram from him, zina. And when she wanted to do zina with him, uh, she saw from the face of Abdullah Nur. She saw what? 
فرأت في وجه عبد الله نورا ساطعا. She saw light glowing from the face of Abdullah. فلما تزوج عبد الله when عبد الله got married to Amina bint Wahb, the mother of who? The mother of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام. When Abdullah got married to Amina bint Wahb, أم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وقع بها. ذهب ذلك النور الذي كان في وجه عبد الله. They said Abdullah did something haram with her. Some of the stories mention that when he got married to Amina bint Wahb, he went to the woman. At the first time, he said no to her. But this, when he got to marry to Amina bint Wahb, he went to her and he presented himself to her. He said, "She said, now I don't see the nur that I saw from you the first time. Now the nur is gone. So I'm not interested in you." This story is not authentic. It's weak and it's. It goes against what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned about his lineage. Salawatullahi wasallam alaihi. He mentioned from his lineage that he did not come. He said, "Lam ma wulitu min sifah." And I was not born from zina. Min ladun Adam. Yani min wakti Adam. From the time of Adam until the Prophet was born, never did his lineage at all come from zina. No one can say that. Only the Prophet ﷺ from the time of Adam until now, he said, "I was not born from zina." So this is invalid. This narration is uh, incorrect. So let's carry on from where we were. Abdullah passed away, and the Prophet ﷺ he was in the womb of his mother uh, two months. His mother was pregnant. So the scholars they discussed did Abdullah actually know that his wife was pregnant. Some of the scholars they said no. Some of the scholars they said yes. There was a discussion. Al Imam Al Hakim Abu Abdullah Al Hakim Al Naisaburi who mentions in his kitab Al Mustadrak he mentions that Qais ibn Makhrama he said to Ufiya Abu who the Prophet's father passed away, wa Ummuhu and his mother, yani Amina bint Wahb. Hubla, she was pregnant. So this is the uh, uh, one view. The first view is what that his mother was pregnant when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's father passed away. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he strengthens that opinion that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his mother was pregnant. His mother was pregnant when his father passed away. Um, Ibn Al Qayyim, he says there are two opinions on this issue, and he said that the strongest opinion, according to me, Ibn Al Qayyim, Ibn Al Qayyim is the teacher of Ibn Al Kathir, right? Is his teacher. He said my opinion also is that his mother was pregnant and he wasn't born. The Prophet wasn't born. The second opinion is that he was born. The Prophet was born when his father passed away, and that opinion is weak. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we know, his father passed away. Whatever opinion you take, he passed away when the Prophet was uh, a yatim, an orphan. What do I mean by that? Yani the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never reached age of puberty. There is no, you can't be an orphan after puberty. You're only an orphan before puberty. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Hadith, and Imam Al-Tabarani narrated in his Mu'jam, and also Al-Haythami in his Kitab Mujma' Al-Zawaid wa Manba' Al-Fawaid. The Prophet said, "لا يُتْمَ بَعْدَ الْحُلْمِ." There is no, you can't be an orphan after you've reached age of puberty. ولا, the Prophet also said, "ولا يُتْمَ لِجَارِيَةٍ." There's no uh, a woman who's an uh, يعني a girl. She can't be an orphan either halvat once she reaches her menstruation. So before, yani reaching puberty, you can be an orphan. Ala kulli the Prophet was a what? A orphan. Alam yajid ka yatiman fa'awa. So the Prophet was a yatim. The poet he said, "Dukirta fil Qur'ani 
بالیوتمی تکریمتا و قیمتا لؤلئ المکنون فی الیوتمی محمد you have been mentioned in the Quran as an orphan and the value of the pearls and the gems is when it's alone the gold if it's rare it's like the value goes up the scholars also mentioned brothers as a side benefit this is very important that we take this into consideration they say in the yatima ليس اليتيم من مات والده إن اليتيم يتيم العلم والعلم والأدب A real orphan is not the one whose father or his mother passes away. The orphan is the one who loses two other things: knowledge and manners. يعني the real orphan is the one who possesses no knowledge and he has no أخلاق and آداب and manners. The scholars, they used to say that information is different from knowledge, right? There's a difference between having information and having what? Having knowledge. If you have information, it means that you have not acted upon what you know or you don't possess akhlaq and adab manners. It's not good to see a person who and he is meant to have knowledge, but they have bad manners. They deal with the people. They are badi, very vulgar and very rude, very disrespectful, condescending. They do not look. They do not respect their elders. They put down. Yeah, the ones who are younger than them. They don't show mercy to them, and they don't show respect to their elders. That person is what is an orphan, even if his parents are alive. And we're living at a time, brothers, where a person would want to seek knowledge, but from a younger age, he was not, he was not nurtured upon manners. What we tend to forget is that the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahabas, the narrations that you would hear from him is less than what they used to see from him. They would sit around him. They would see how he would deal with his يعني, enemies. They would see how he deals with his family. They would see how he deals with the other companions. One day the Prophet ﷺ, a man came and the Prophet ﷺ, as you know, he used to wear two cloaks, one top and one bottom. So a man came, فَجَذَبَهُ He dragged the Prophet ﷺ, he grabbed the Prophet and he pulled him. Sallallahu Jadba. And in the narration says excessively that the line could be seen on the Prophet's neck. You have to understand this is the Prophet of Allah. At that time, he's the leader of the Muslims. Everyone that's sitting there is like he, they would protect him from anything. So this man dragged, pushed, pulled him like that. And then the man said to the Prophet, Give me from the wealth of Allah that you have. Because the Prophet just received the spoils of war. It was in the Prophet's possession. So he said to him, give me from the wealth of Allah. This is not your dad's wealth. Or it's not your wealth. It's the wealth of Allah. Give it to me. The narration mentioned when he dragged the Prophet. When the Prophet turned around, he was smiling. Sah brothers, we would say, disrespectful individual. We would be violent, sah? He smiled. And then the Prophet said to him, give this man what he wants. Yani the thing that the Prophet had, if you study his seerah and his biography, the, one of the qualities that you saw from him والسلام, was that he knew the people he was dealing with. Some of them were Bedouins that didn't understand and comprehend. And the Messenger والسلام, showed softness and generosity and kindness. Are you with me? But whereas his closest students, the closest ones around him, he would tell them the truth. Yani, he would tell the truth to everybody, but I mean, he was different in the way he dealt with Abu Bakr, and Umar, and Uthman, and Ali, than in comparison to the way he dealt with a Bedouin man that would just randomly come. There was a time when the Prophet ﷺ prohibited, and he banned 
anyone asking questions. Everyone was banned from asking questions. Does that make sense? So the Sahabas were not able to ask questions. The narration mentions, the Sahabas, they said, it used to fascinate us. We used to wish that a Bedouin man would come and he would ask a very good question. Because the Bedouin man doesn't care. When he comes, he would ask. The Bedouins were different. They, wouldn't, they, had, they didn't have this yani, personality where... So a man would shout from far to the Prophet and the Prophet ﷺ would respond to him. Are we all together? So it's very important, brothers, that we remember those two things. If you don't have them, you're an orphan. You don't have knowledge of your religion. And you don't have manners and etiquette. Remember, this is Yutum. You're an orphan. Abdullah's father passed away. And Abdullah was 25 years of age, that's what was said. The father of the Prophet was 25 years of age when he passed away. Which again, brothers, brings us to the important matter of death and how it can be any time. Some people, they think that inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to repent when I grow older. Inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to rectify my, my life. I'm still young now. To be honest, statistics actually shows that more people pass away young. There are more people who die younger than the age of 30 than those who die after it. Does that make sense? Death doesn't look at your age and how old you are. A lot of young people have passed away. In the last few days, we've heard or seen, or we've come into contact with or heard of people who passed away very young, right? Allah Ta'ala, He says, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ دَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازْ وَمَا الْحَيَةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَعُ الْغُرُورِ Everyone is going to taste that cup of death. There's a, this is, I want you to vision it like this. And it's a, it's a statement my mother would every, every time say to somebody who loses their loved ones. My mom and my mother would always say, we're all, we're all on the route. We're all on the road. It's just that this person has gone before us. But we're all coming. And it's true, if you think like that, you'll realize it's a long line and everyone sips that cup and they die. And you're in, you're in that line. You don't know how many people are in front of you. Are you the next one? Are you this one? So if you've lived an age where you can realize right from wrong and you've reached age of puberty, then that means you have no excuse. Once you reach that age, if you reach that age where you can think and you can see and you can ponder and you can contemplate, then the truth of the matter is you have no excuse after that. Once you reach that age, there is. And then if your beard, you've got a few white hairs in your beard or head, yeah, then now you're even, even more now. If you've got white hair or white beard, one, one, fear Allah, remember now, your time is, you're moving towards your grave. Every day you're getting closer to what? To your qabr and your grave. What really matters is what you've prepared and what you've got ready for that day. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah makes us from those people who have worked hard, who've exerted effort. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He doesn't expose our private sins and the wrongs that we have done. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He forgives us for it. And I ask Allah wa ta'ala that he makes us from those people 
who when they come to him Yawm Al-Qiyamah and Allah tells us, did you not do this? Did you not say this? Did you not act in these ways? And we say, Ya Rabbi, we did. And Allah says to us, in the dunya, I concealed it for you. And in this here, in the akhirah, I'm going to forgive you for it. Always remember, brothers, always remember, Wallahi, life is very, very short. Very, very short. You're not going to live here forever. You're not going to stay here forever. That's for sure. Death is a hatmul lazim. It's a definite thing. It's going to happen. Whether you're a Christian or you're a Muslim or you're a Jew or you're an atheist, it doesn't matter. This is something everyone agrees upon. Sah? Is there any religion or any ideology that believes death is not going to happen to anyone? It's believed by everybody. It's an ijma, consensus on all grounds. And the people to, are one of two. The first group are those إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَا اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَادُونَ نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاؤُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ Those who said Allah is our Lord and they were steadfast on that. إِنَّ الَّذِي قَالُوا رَبُّنَا اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا اسْتِقَامَ They were upright. That's the first group. I ask Allah, He makes us from them. It's not enough, brothers, to say, I only believe in Allah. It's not enough. You also have to be steadfast and strong on that religion. Have to be. And the second group of people are who? The criminals, the wrongdoers, the mujrimeen. Allah says, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذِ الظَّالِمُونَ فِي غَبْرَاتِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ بَاسِطُ أَيْدِيهِمْ أَخْرِجُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ الْيَوْمَ تُجَزَوْنَ عَذَابَ الْهُونِ these people, they're going to be what? The criminals, the wrongdoers, the evil people. They're not, the angels are not going to give them good glad tidings. The angels are going to tell them, يعني, اليوم, today, you'll be rewarded and you're going to be given a very evil ending. Oh Allah, forgive us for our sins and our wrongdoings. So Abdullah, he died at the age of 25. He passed away. And he left behind five camels and a small portion of goats. And, and he left a, uh, a uh, Jariya Habashiya, an Abyssinian uh, slave. And this woman is a very righteous woman. Um Ayman, who knows who she is? I already said her name. But who knows about her? Or Mu'ayman, who knows about her? Yeah? Anyone other than Ahmed? Hey, Faddal at the back. Ha. Huh. She took care of the Prophet. Whose mother? I can't hear you. Stand up, stand up first. Sorry. Zakallahu khairan. Are She took care of the Prophet as, as his mother. That's right. But anything other than that? Wait, Ahmed. No, it's somebody else. Ha. Huh. She was the first person to take care of and nurse the Prophet. Anything other than that? Other than what she's done for the Prophet. Anyone else know who Ayman is? Only ah Ahmed knows. Hey? Anything other than what she's done for the Prophet? Hey, Ahmed, tell us. She outlived the Prophet. No, something else I'm looking for. She's the mother of Osama ibn Zaydin. The Prophet married her off to Zayd ibn al-Harith. Are we all together? That's why Usama had a dark complexion. Because of who? His mom, Umm Ayman. Are we all together? So this is important, these things connect. Umm Ayman is the mother of Usama ibn Zayd. You all know Usama ibn, uh, Zayd ibn al-Harith, right? Zayd ibn al-Harith is the child that the Prophet ﷺ took him as a what? As his own son. And he actually, at one point, 
He was called what? Zayd ibn Muhammad. Are we all together? And I'll tell you guys a benefit many of you guys may not have come across. Zayd is the only person who's mentioned in the Quran by name. You know that, right? Do you know why? The scholars, they say, it is because Zayd was given a title of, or he was named Zayd ibn Muhammad. And then ayah came down where the Prophet was told not to do that. Allah says, Ud'uhum li abaihim, hu aqsatu inda Allah, sah? We're not allowed to call a person by a name other than their father. However, however much we love them. So one day he lost the name of being called Zayd ibn Muhammad. Imagine you got raised that high. And you got given that name, Zayd ibn Muhammad ibn Abdullah, and you're walking around and everyone's calling you by that name. And then guess what happens? Just when that verse comes down, that gets taken back from you and you get given back your old name. And to honor him, Allah mentioned his name in the Quran. Zayd his wife was who? <laughs> yeah? Who's his wife's name? Zainab bint Jahshin was the wife of who? Zayd ibn al sorry. She was the wife of who? No, he, she was the wife of who? The, she became the wife of the Prophet later. And the reason why this happened is it Zayn, Zaynab bint Harith or Zayn, Zaynab bint Jahshin? Zaynab bint Jahshin that Zayd ibn Harith was married to. I remember the hadith where she said, Zawaja kunna ahali kunna. She said to the other wives of the Prophet, Your families married you off. Wazawajani Allahu. Allah married me off. Me focus up. I said, My wife from high above. Sah? The, the Prophet married her. And this was to really cut off the whole issue of this culture that they had is that if you took a child and you gave him that name of yours and then he became one of yours, that, you, that he becomes your child. The Qur'an was trying to say that doesn't happen. And to really finalize that point, the Prophet was told to marry his wife. So that hukum doesn't exist. So they don't start becoming blurry later and people say, I can just take a random child and name him mine and that's it. He can live with me and they had that culture. So the Prophet ﷺ was told, first of all, take back the name. And second thing is, once Zaynab, uh, Zayd divorced his wife and Allah already knew that Zayd and Zaynab would not make up. The Prophet Sallallahu married Zaynab, the wife of Zayd ibn Harith. Are we all together? But also Zayd ibn al-Harith married after that who? He married Ummu Ayman. And when he married Ummu Ayman, she gave birth to who? Usama. The Prophet married her to uh, Umm Ayman. Umm Ayman is a unique woman. She took Islam at a very early stage. She embraced Islam straight away when, it was in, when, when she was told about it. And she was from the people who migrated to Abyssinia, her land of, of, of origin. And she stayed there. And she passed away at the Khilafah of Uthman ibn Affan. She outlived the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So she was very young when Abdullah passed away. She was very young and she was an honorable woman. Um, there's a story when the Prophet passed away, uh, Abu Bakr and Umar, they said, we want to go and visit Umm Ayman. And let's go to her and talk to her. So they went to her. Does anyone know the story? So I want to see who's heard this story before. When Abu Bakr and Umar went to Umm Ayman. Ah, Fadl Shaykh. Hey, 
هي. And she was crying, صح? أم أيمن was crying, هي. سبحان الله. ومؤيمن they came and Abu Bakr and Umar came to visit her. And when they visit her and they came to her, she started to cry. And she told them and she informed them of why she so they, and when she cried, she made Abu Bakr and Umar cry. And they cried from her crying. And she said something very powerful to them. She said, I'm not crying necessarily because the Prophet passed away per se, because I know where he's going is better than where he was right now. The Prophet's in a greater place and a more honorable place. But the reason why I'm crying, she said, is because the revelation has now come to an end. We're no longer going to receive wahy min sama. It shows you that they felt the revelation when it came down. And it meant a lot to their hearts and mind. It meant a what? It meant a lot to them. So Ummu Ayman, this is a woman, she was, she was a great uh, woman. Now inshallah ta'ala we're going to start and talk about a little bit about the Prophet's birth alayhi salatu salam and the revelation coming down. We're gonna, this, is, this is the segment that we're going to start. We're going to start from the Prophet's birth and we're going to carry on in great details inshallah ta'ala until the revelation uh, came down on him alayhi salatu salam. So that's going to be a very long journey inshallah ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he was born on a Monday. There's no dispute, there's no khilaf on that. He clearly categorically said, I was born on a Monday. So the Prophet was born on a what? Monday. Anything other than that is disputed according to the scholars. Anything other than that is what? Is disputed. The month in which he was born is disputed. Even the year that he was born is disputed. Okay? It's also disputed. The date in which he was born, Hatta, is also disputed. Okay? You can hold an opinion of which day is, uh, sorry, what the date was. You can hold an opinion on that. You can strengthen that, that's not a problem, but it's all disputed. The only thing that's not disputed, and there's a consensus on it, and there's a clear cut evidence on, is that he was born on a, a Monday. So inshallah ta'ala, we're going to take the opinion that he was born on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal. We'll take that opinion inshallah ta'ala, as it seems to be the strongest inshallah ta'ala. And a large of the muhaqqiqeen hold that, hold that opinion. And he was born in the year Amul Fil, the year of the elephant. And we spoke about the story of the elephant and Abraha and all of that. We spoke about it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sayyidul Khalq, the best and the master of the creation. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was born fi shi'bi bani Hashimin, bi Makkah al mukarramah The Prophet was born where? In Mecca. He was born in what city? Mecca. In a small valley of the people of bani Hashim, his people. This is the opinion Ibn Kathirin says, it's the, like the most famous view according to the overwhelming majority of scholars. And other opinions are mentioned, inshallah ta'ala. There are some benefits in the Prophet's birth of, in the month of uh, Shah Rabi' al-Awwal. I mean, that month in which he was born, there are some benefits in it. Some of the scholars mention this. The month of Rabi' al-Awwal, it actually falls in the middle of all the months. Also, the name Rabi' what does it mean in English? Spring, right? And a spring is something that gushes out. So the scholars, they mention, there's also a feeling in there, okay? Isharatun liman tafattana, liman tafattana laha ila ishtiqaqi lafdi rabi'i, lianna fihi tafaulan hasanan bi basharati ummatihi. فالربيع تنشق الأرض عما في بطنها 
من نعم الله تعالى the spring is a water that comes out of the earth that water gives people it means drink and water and so the prophet are coming out that's another benefit the scholars mention we're going to now mention some of the signs that happened when the prophet was born there were some alamat some signs that were seen when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born number one a light came from his mother when he was born alayhi salatu wassalam this light adaat minhu qusur sham this light illuminated the palaces of sham al imam ahmad narrated fi musnadihi in his musnad also al imam uh, hakim uh, not hakim al imam uh, ibn hibban al busti any sahih with an authentic chain of narration authentic inshallah ta'ala that al irbad ibn sariya radiyallahu anhu he said sami'tu i heard rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam yaqulu i heard the prophet say inni 'inda allah maktub bi khatam al nabiyyin bi khatam bi khatam al nabiyyin the prophet said i am written okay the prophet said i am written with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I am the seal of all prophets yani there is no prophet after me wa inna adam alayhi salam and that adam alayhi salam la munjalidun munjalidun is that the yani mulqatun ala al-jidalati wa hiya al-ard yani adam alayhi salam is thrown stone on an, an open land wa uh, yani the children of adam and those who come from him are all going to be part of those lands that are taken from Adam was taken from portions of the land and that's what he was created from and everyone that you see the color the nature that you see is the part, part of the land that he was taken from some of the earth is hard some people's personalities are hard some of the land was dark so some of the people are dark some of the land was light and if some people are light some of the land is soft so those people are soft so all people's natures come from that was akhbirukum and i will inform you the prophet said bi awwali dhalik da'wah to abi ibrahim wa bishara to akhi isa wa ru'ya ummi allati ra'at hina wada'at li wa annahu kharaja minha nurun adaat laha this is the part i want annahu kharaja minha nurun adaat laha minhu qusur sham that from the mother when she gave birth light came from her that illuminated shine as far as sham from mecca to sham and this hadith is authentic so that was the first sign that was seen number 1 zuhur al najmi a star appeared okay this also ibn ishaq mentioned in his sirah and the chain for it inshallah ta'ala is authentic Also the third thing is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he came out of the womb of his mother and children when they come out how do they come out first head first or legs first head and their heads tend to face yani the, the prophet sallallahu alaihi head was raised risen up when he came out waqa arafi ar ra'sahu ila as sama the narration mentions that ibn hibban mentions in his sahih uh, and inshallah ta'ala some of the scholars they authenticated it bi mujma'i turuqiha there's inqita and disconnection in it here or there can it salihatu li shawahid it can be used any other sign that is mentioned other than those three are not authentic any other signs that some of the scholars mention none of them are what are authentic and are inshallah ta'ala what about the circumcision of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam when he was born the scholars they talk about it circumcision for the men is it obligatory it's obligatory for the men 
And for the women, there was a difference of a, there was a difference of opinion. Some scholars, they hold the opinion that even for the women is what? Obligatory, and some scholars, they hold that it's not. And of course, the circumcision, it's not mutilation for the women. It's not any harm for her, as much as not a harm for the man, it shouldn't. But some practices are very, yani, wrong. But I will reserve my opinion on the women's circumcision. I will reserve my opinion for now. Yeah? And what the strongest opinion to me is. As for the khitam of the Prophet ﷺ, that which is sahih is that Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's grandfather, he was the one who circumcised the Prophet ﷺ on the seventh. Okay? And this was the Arab practice, that the child would be circumcised on the seventh. A lot of parents, they don't circumcise their children until he's what? A few years, right? We, in the Indian culture, is it to circumcise the child uh, in the subcontinent? Is it to circumcise the child before seven? seven? Seven days, by the way, it's not seven years. Is it, or is it after that? Huh? Huh? In the subcontinent? Huh? After the seven days, they do it. Long time, two, three years, they, t they take their time. Whose culture is that it should be done before seven days? Huh, huh. Seven days they do it, Sahih. The eighth day, Sahih. The Jews, they do it on the eighth day, Sahih. Amen. So the Arabs add that their norms was to circumcise what? Yeah, and he, the seventh day. Ibn Abdul Bar mentions it in his isti'ab, uh, that this opinion that the Prophet was circumcised on the seventh day by his grandfather. Some scholars, they try to mention that the Prophet was born circumcised. And that is not, that's not true. He wasn't born, sallallahu alayhi wa circumcised, and there is no evidence for that. Abdul Muttalib was very happy when he saw um, Abdul Muttalib, when he found out and he saw Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Extremely happy. And he was the one that gave him that name, Muhammad. He actually mentioned why he gave him that name. He said that I've given you this name, so if anybody ever calls you, would always call you Muhammad, the one that is what? Praiseworthy. Which is another thing, brothers, the children, the names that you give them, the names that you give your children is very important in the child's growth. It plays a significant role in the child's name, yeah, in life and his growth. When you tell your child, I have named you after this prophet, or I've named you after this Sahabi, or I've named you after the wives of the Prophet it gives the child something that they have to yeah, imitate and follow. Ibn al-Qayyim, go to his kitab, Tuhfatul Mawlud, Tuhfatul Mawdud fi Ahkam al Mawlud, where he talks about the rulings related to the children. He mentions benefits related to the naming of the child. And so we should avoid shortening the names of the children when they are, uh, they have good names. So, for example, some people they will shorten Muhammad, some people will shorten the name Abdullahi. Are we all together? Keep the full name for your child. Because look at it, brothers. When people tend to not practice the deen and they go onto the streets, and a lot of you guys would know from the UK, what do they do to their names? They take her. So one of the, uh, the first things that you do when you want to go bad is the, your, your name and the way you, what you're called. Do you guys agree or am I just, am I just making that up? Yeah, there's always that street name that you have, right? Sah? There's that street, so name is very important. Are we all together? 
So keep the name. Walidalika, I'll tell you guys a story. When my wife was having my first child, uh, my oldest daughter, the midwife came to the house. You all know what a midwife is, right? A midwife. She came to the house and she would ask my wife, how is everything? How are you doing? Is everything right? And she would uh, help my wife. She had a very hard name. I couldn't pronounce her name. I struggled to say her name. And what's very ajeeb was, every time I said her name wrong, she wouldn't let it go. She would correct me. She would tell me, excuse me, that's not my name. I've told you what my name is. A few minutes goes by, I forget her name. And then I say something wrong, she corrects me again. Before that time, I used to let people say my name according to how they want to. When I'd go to places, if people couldn't say my name, yeah, Abdurrahman, they can't pronounce it. I'd let it slide. So, no problem. They haven't, they, they haven't studied Makhariji Khuruf. <laughs> Ever since that day, I learned a big lesson. The import, and she was right. That's her name. I should say the way that her, she wants her name to be said. So, so hey, I should. So do I. I have a better name. So every time our conversation starts with, let me teach you how to pronounce it. And I will, not in a disrespectful way, but I let them, and they could say it. So don't let them say Abdi or Abdul or don't know. Especially when you go to Starbucks and they say, what name should we write for you on the... Yeah? Don't give them a short version of your name. Tell them what? the blessed name Allah has given you, or your parents gave you, mention it. And that can be a form of da'wah, honestly. That could be a what? A form of da'wah. I was on a flight one time, and I was sitting to, next to a non-Muslim. This guy was very respectful, and he asked me a good question. He said to me, why is every person from my country, Somalia, why are they all called Abdis? He asked me that question. And I told him, SubhanAllah, that it's not all Abdi. He said, what do you mean? I said, it's actually short from something. He said, what do you mean by that? And we went through Allah's names. That Abdi is slave of either Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And he said, why would somebody walk around and be happy to be called slave of nothing. So that's a very good question. A very good, good question. I said they're meant to be saying slave of who? Of Allah. Slave of Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. So he goes, next time, when I meet somebody and they tell me my name is Abdul or Abdi, I would make sure I ask them, what is the name of Allah that is missing from there. So, so I can call them by their full name. So he realized that. And so it's important, brothers, these names have an effect on a person. To name your children, not because it sounds nice. I saw with my two eyes and I heard with my two ears a child that his parents called him, not because they had knowledge. They didn't have the knowledge. But they said your names, because they liked the way it pronounced, they said your name is Jahim. Wallahi. I said, Jahim. Do you know what that is? So some people believe anything that's in the Quran is a good name. Sah? Any name that's in the Quran is a good name. Some people believe that, right? Have you guys come across some people who believe that? And what is mentioned in the Quran? Sah? Iblis is mentioned in the Quran, Sah? Fir'aun is mentioned in the Quran. Abu Lahab is mentioned in the Quran, Sah? So it's very dangerous. Just because a name is in the Quran, it doesn't mean it's what? It's necessarily a good name. Because the Quran talks about so many different people, or different ideologies, or different things. 
Be very careful. Somebody picked up the Quran, hey? Sharrul Bariya. They opened the Mus'haf and randomly wanted to pick a name. And so they called their child, Ula'ika Hum. They, they randomly picked the word Sharrul Bariya. So it's really not something to laugh about because a lot of people don't have that knowledge, brothers and sisters. But we have to educate them and inform them that this is it's not, the, it's not the way forward. It's not the way you should. And I'll tell you, brothers, you think it's a, it's, it's a light issue, but the name is very important. So keep that in mind when you're from the tarbiyah, the scholars that speak about it, they always mention from the, the way to cultivate your children properly is the name choosing and picking those names. Don't say it's, it's a common name. Don't say it's a common name. It's important. Alhamdulillah, I think in the UK, I don't know this year or the year before, but three years ago, the, the name Muhammad was one of the top 10 names in the UK, Muhammad. Allahumma bari. So it's reached everywhere. It's a form of da'wah, haqiqatan. That name being everywhere, everyone hearing about it. It's a, it's a, so the Prophet was called Muhammad. Does anyone else, else know his other names? From the names of the Prophet alayhi sallam. Hayyafadal. Ahmed is also his name. Does anyone know the verse in which the name Ahmed is mentioned? Hey. Anyone know? Yeah? I, I didn't hear it. What surah is it first? Surah to Saf, mashallah. Hey, what's the ayah? وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرِيَّةَ وَبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ هَيَّ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ هَيَّ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ هَيَّ مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُ رَحَدِ يَجَوْتْ No problem. So Ahmed mentioned in the Qur'an, هَيَّ By the way, how many places is the name Muhammad mentioned in the Qur'an? Huh? Four times, correct. Who knows those four times? You can go through it with me. In the Quran, in order, we went in chronological order. Yeah, Ahl al Quran, Ya Al Samit Fadl, the highest, the, the, the top one where it starts from. Where Allah mentioned Muhammad. No Google, don't look at Sheikh Google. I want Hufad. Yeah? Hey, what's it? Where's the ayah? Muhammad Rasulullah is not Ali Imran. That's what surah is that Muhammad Rasulullah? The last ayah is Surah Al-Fatiha. Now, hey, what's, what's in Surah Al-Ali Ibrahim? Yeah? وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبَتُمْ عَلَىٰ عَقَابِكُمْ وَيَنْقَلِبَ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرُ اللَّهِ شَيْءٍ وَسَيَرْزِ اللَّهُ شَاكِرِينَ That's one ayah. You got three more to go. I want it chronological order. Shart. Yeah? Ayah? Fadl. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَبَ النَّبِيِّينَ Is that right? The Surah Al-Hazab. But is that the second one? Or is there something before that? Yeah? وَهُوَ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Ayah? So Ahzab we mentioned, Hayyah, and after that is what? What's the third one? وَالَّذِي نُزِلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدِ وَهُوَ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّ That's Surah Muhammad, Hayyah, that's the third, Hayyah. And then the last one, the fourth one is what? وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ Which is Surah to? Surah Al-Fatihah, right? No, sorry, Muhammad al-Rasulullah al-Ladhina ma'a wa shidda al kuffar The last one is Surah Muhammad, right? Uh, Surah Al-Fatih, the last ayah. So the four is mentioned. And one time, Ahmed's mentioned. How many times has it been mentioned in the Qur'an? Five times. Has Allah ever spoken to the Prophet directly by using his name? It's a benefit. Never. Allah has never said, Ya Muhammad, never. Is either described as a prophet or a messenger 
or a description of how he is. Ya ayyuhal nabi, ya ayyuhal rasul, ya ayyuhal muddathir, ya ayyuhal muzzammil. Like the other prophets, ya nuhu qad jadaltana fa aktarta jidalana, ya nuhu, ya nuhu. قَدْ جَادَلْتَنَا فَأَكْثَرْتَ جِدَالَنَا فَأْتِنَا بِمَا تَعِيدُنَا إِنْ كُنْتَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ قَدْ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا يَا مُوسَى إِنِّي اصْطَفَيْتُكَ عَلَى النَّاسِ بِرِسَالَاتِهِ يَا عِيسَى يَا يَا يَحْيَى خُذِ الْكِتَابَ بِقُوَّةِ and all the prophets, or a lot of the prophets, Allah mentioned the Quran by their names and He addresses them. Like in Nabi Lai Muhammad, Allah says what? And this is what? To honor the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And to raise him. Hey, that was the first name, Muhammad and Ahmed. Hey, any other names of the Prophet? Put your hand up if you know more names of the Prophet. Hey, yeah. Huh? Hamid. So Hamid is mushtaq from the name of Muhammad and Ahmed. Hey, yeah, Al Mustafa. Hey, the chosen one. Hey, what else? Yeah, Al Hadi. Is Al Hadi from the names of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Hey, yeah, Al Tahir. Yeah, Al Amin is just trustworthy one. That was a title that was given to him. Hey, Al Mahi. You say Mahi? Huh? Taha. Taha, is it the name from the names of the Prophet? That which seems apparent? No. Somebody like I mentioned Al Mahi, right? Al Mahi is from the names of the Prophet. What does Al Mahi mean? So the Prophet Al Mahi means the one who cleans and cleanses and what? Gets rid of disbelief. What are also his names? Al Hashir. Why was Al Hashir mean? Yeah? The one who? Hashir, what does it mean first of all? What does Hashir mean? The gather. So what, how, what, what does it mean here? Yeah? The people will be gathered around him. What about another name from his names? Say no. Huh? That's his kunya, hey, his name. Al Aqib. Sah. What does Al Aqib mean? So he's going to be the last, and there's no prophet after him. So these are all of his names. He mentioned them. In one hadith, he mentioned all of those four names that we mentioned. Sah. So it's, it's important to know those names of the Prophet. I'm going to conclude with one last final benefit. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for two which are created and two which are not created. Their names are what the scholars call A'lamun bi'atibari dalalatiha ala al الأعلام باعتبار دلالتها على الذات وأوصاف باعتبار دلالتها على المعاني. Remember this. Four. I'll explain what I just said right now. Four, two which are created, and two which are not created. Their names are what they are. Their name. They live by, or they are those names. They represent the meaning of those names. Everybody other than those four, they could have those names and it may not even mean something. You might see somebody whose name is called Abdullah and he's never worshipped Allah. He's not even a Muslim. <laughs> Does that make sense? Someone might be called Al Amin and he's never told the truth or rarely tells the truth or is not trustworthy. Sah? Someone's called Muhammad and everyone does not praise him. They find him a problem in the community. Sah? Like in these four, their names is a representation of who they are. So I wonder who can tell me these four. One of them is easy, is our, our prophet. 
So he's created one. Hey, next one is what? Yeah? No. Yeah? No. So the, sec the second one that was mentioned is Allah. Allah is not created. All of Allah's names are who, what He is. Are we all together, brothers? The name Allah, Al Rahman, Al Rahim, Al Malik, Al Quddus, Al Salam, Al Mu'min, Al Muhaymin, Al Aziz, Al Jabbar, Al Mutakabbir, Al Ghalik, Al Bari, Al Musawwir. All of the 99 names of Allah that we know, every one of those names are Allah's. Yani you, you learn Allah through those names. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Allah and the Prophet. Allah is not created and the Prophet is created. So we have one that's created and one that's not created. It is now one that's not created and one that is created that's missing. The Arsh, no. Hmm? The Quran. The Quran is not created, right? You got confused when I said two that are not created. Everyone here is thinking Allah and then what else can that? Ah, what else could not be created other than Allah? Sah. The Quran is not created, it's the speech of Allah. The Quran has many names, right? The Quran has many names, right? All of those names of the Quran are representation of what the Quran is. Al Furqan is one of the names of the Quran, right? And what does that do? It distinguishes truth from falsehood. Sah? Are we all together? It's also called Al Mushaf, right? Because it was compiled in a what? It's also called Al-Qur'an because it's what? Al-Matlu, it's recited. So these are the names of the Qur'an. The last one, who can tell us? The Days of Judgment, mashallah. Correct. The Day of Judgment has many names. Yawmul Taghabur, Yawmul Qiyam, Yawmul Akhira, sah? All of these names are reality of the Day of Judgment. And the Day of Judgment is created. Does that make sense? And when we say the Day of Judgment, everything in it is also the same. Jannah and all of that is also part of the Day of Judgment. I'm going to stop there, inshallah ta'ala. Any mistakes or shortcomings or errors or faults that I made while I was speaking is for me and Shaytan and Allah and His Messenger are both free from it. Subhanakallah wa bihamdi ashadu an la ilaha illallah astaghfiruka wa atubu